I think people were expecting her to depart at some point in this parliamentary term, but there was no hint of it coming uh, right now at this time. So yeah, so, surprise for everyone to be. Okay, so what have been the key issues over her eight years at the top? And well, she came into office as First Minister, having been the Deputy First Minister for seven years. So she was a leading player already uh, before she took the top job. And that came immediately after the independence referendum, which was uh, defeated, obviously, uh, resulting in a no vote. So that could have been really difficult for the SNP, their main focus um, being defeated in that referendum. But I, I think her main success uh, in that time is ensuring that her party is the dominant force in Scottish politics. She's leaving uh, the post of leader of the SNP uh, with uh, uh, her um, successor being able to inherit an incredibly successful political party in office. Some of the, the challenges that she sets herself, the objectives that she set herself, uh, particularly around things like closing the attainment gap between uh, wealthier and, and poorer children in schools, um, some of those have not been fulfilled, um, but she also presided over COVID um, and COVID Governance in Scotland, like everywhere else in the world, became the dominant issue that kind of pushed aside um, other things. And of course, um, the aftermath of COVID and the economic situation um, has made things even more difficult. And her popularity has been on the wane? Only very recently. And I think in relation to a specific um, context with um, challenging legislation and debates around trans rights and making it easier to uh, facilitate the process of um, uh, people, those who want to, to transition um, their, their sex. So that's been a difficult issue, one that she was personally committed to, um, but and there was a bit of a dent in her popularity around, but really only in the last month. She still is more popular than any of the other uh, leaders by some distance and her party remains uh, the, the most popular as well. So I don't think there was any sense in which she's going now because she was pushed. Um, I think this is um, a decision that she has taken um, on her terms and at her a time of her choosing. There was certainly no pressure from within her party to go. And so I think she's just tired. She's been in office um, for eight years. She's seen several prime ministers in that time in Downing Street. Um, and she was in you know, office as deputy for seven years prior to that. So I think she's just tired and yeah. felt it was time to go. Okay, so explain, Nicola, explain for an Antipodean audience the, the status of Scotland within the UK and the ongoing push for independence. Sure, so Scotland is recognised as a nation within the United Kingdom, but in terms of its system of government, it has a system that we call devolution, it's not unlike uh, the, the, the powers and responsibilities of the Australian states, but the UK is not a federal system. So there is um, perhaps more of a hierarchy than we would expect in a federation um, with the dominance of Westminster um, still in, in that system. So we've seen recent examples um, around the transgender legislation uh, where the Secretary of State, for the first time ever, was able to intervene to veto uh, that piece of legislation. Now, that may be challenged further down the line, uh, but that's a, a wee indication of the differences between devolution within the, the United Kingdom and a federal system like you have in Australia. And so where does the push for independence stand now? So um, still quite high. Again, just as her popularity took a bit of a dip and support for independence took a bit of a dip in the last month or so as well. But we have no way of knowing um, if that's a temporary blip. Um, but if we take a, a look back over the last six months, say, and look at the average of polling, then support for independence is historically uh, high, but it's still an issue that divides Scotland pretty much down the middle. And I think Nicola Sturgeon today in her resignation statement was also acknowledging in a sense, she didn't quite put it like this, but that she had taken independence as far as she could because she has now become a figure who people love or or dislike um, and so she felt that it needed somebody now who could maybe reach out beyond those entrenched positions uh, to try to um, build a sustained majority of support for independence 
The pathway to independence is uh, unclear, which is another issue, and I think will will be the, the dominant issue in any leadership contest that may uh, follow, uh, because the referendum, which was Nicola Sturgeon's chosen pathway and her party's chosen pathway, that's now not an option because the Supreme Court ruled that the Scottish Parliament doesn't have the powers to legislate for independence and it would need the approval of the Westminster Parliament and that's not forthcoming anytime soon. So there is now an issue, a debate around what, where does the SNP go? There's no doubt that the party and any successor will be committed to independence. That's the reason why people join the SNP in the main. Um, but how do you get there from here? Mm. And that's uh, one of the biggest challenges the party faces. And so if that was Nicola Sturgeon's ultimate goal, do you think she leaves the position with a degree of regret that she wasn't able to achieve that? Possibly, um, but she, I think she leaves um, her party in a stronger position on the independence issue than it was even at the point that she took office. So it could have been that the, the defeat in the referendum not things sideways. Obviously, lots of things have happened since then. Most significantly, Brexit um, is primarily the reason why we're still having these debates and it's a live issue uh, once again. Um, but but not, I'm sure she would have loved to have been the first minister to deliver independence. And maybe no first minister will. You know, it's not an inevitability at all. Uh, but I think in terms of the independence movement, um, it's it's in a reasonably strong uh, place. Certainly, historically speaking, um, Scotland seems um, closer to independence than it has done uh, previously, although it still may be some way off. OK, Nicola McEwen, thanks for explaining that all so clearly for us on the other side of the world. And thanks right. again for staying up so late for us. Cheers.